We, we have been uh, supporting you, unfortunately, feeling sometimes, uh, you know, difficult to, to give everything we wanted to, to give to you during uh, these uh, very, very difficult and terrible times. We have invited you because we think it's important for us in France to convey to the French, to our members and to all the other personalities who have decided to be part of this discussion this morning. It's very important for us to, to give you the access to them and, and, and the possibility to express, first of all, your observation, analysis, and, uh, and feelings about what's going on in your country. And for us, as for Aspen Kiev, it's very important to build those dialogue bridges with uh, our partners to uh, communicate uh, what we are experiencing in Ukraine through our personal stories, through our personal perspective. So what we are experiencing today in Ukraine uh, is a war of independence and it's a fight for human values as we see it. This is a cruel, bloody war. It takes people's life, it destroys family, the children are getting killed. The enemy rapes our women and uh, kids, girls. They send our people by force to Russia just to show, to, to record as propaganda TV channels, uh, TV shows for their Russian channels and uh, to show Russians as savers. They destroy homes. They demolish whole cities like Mariupol, Vordovaha, Kharkiv. And uh, as we believe we are defending not only for Ukraine, but for this democratic order of the world, for this basic human values. The reality of the tragedies in Ukraine speaks by itself, and there is no need for additional world of, uh, of introduction. Uh, just to say that this is indeed, as Jean-Luc has mentioned, an exceptional session and a quite a unique opportunity for um, uh, our uh, guests and audience really to to hear and to exchange with those who are really on the front line. Now we all are ministers in charge of victory of Ukraine, and we do whatever is needed to make sure that this day is as close as possible. So um, on 24th of February, Kremlin started the bloodiest war in Europe since the Second World War. It is already confirmed in each and every platform and seen throughout the pictures and multiple evidences of the brutality, which we only learned from the lessons of history over the last decade. Putin was talking about preventing genocide in Ukraine in his rhetorics, and now the Russian army is systematically killing and torturing civilians. At this moment, the number of those civilians who has died or been wounded over this war is significantly higher than the losses among the military force in Ukraine. We have also started to use the terminology, which seemed to be something only targeted to recall the tragedies of the past, like filtration camps, forceful displacement of people, and massive massive disappearance of people from the territory of Ukraine. It's only to our data that 45,000 of Ukrainians has been forcefully deported to Russian Federation. We do not have information either where they are or where what is happening to them. All of these atrocities are a deliberate policy sanctioned by the Russian highest political and military leadership. These atrocities are taking place all over occupied territories. It is not just Bucha, you've all seen and heard about. Russia's aim to ensure that Ukrainians are not exist as nation. And this is the mainstream narrative you can, you can trace throughout all of the rhetorics from Putin to his media. Around 80% of Russian citizens support this war and mass killings of Ukrainians. This is a shared responsibility. At Russian talk shows, there are open, de uh, detailed discussions of further offensive attacks, not only to Ukraine, but also to Poland, Poland, Baltic states, and now Finland and Sweden. 
here in the Aspen community, I always felt like home. I always been surrounded by the opinion leaders, but now it's time to be surrounded by action leaders. And it's really complicated to see and to hear the discussions that uh, uh, like statement done by uh, the leadership of Austria, Germany, and Hungary that uh, the losses bad um, uh, bad with this war should be the losses of Russian Federation, but not of the European Union or European states. The losses you face with the with your economies. These are the losses of lives of our people. These are the losses which will not lead to unprosperity of your economies. Of course, we've been talking a lot about the uh, large scale consequences of this war, which are not only uh, uh, around the, the military conflict. One fifth part of the population of the world will suffer from the lack of, uh, uh, from the breaking of the security, uh, food security chains, from the, from the lack of food around the world. And this is the uh, inertia which has been launched by this, by this war. And large-scale consequences will cover the whole economies around the world. And, and mostly Asian and African countries will suffer from that. So what we are now talking about is that no-fly zone should be insured at least over the Black Sea to make sure that we can restore the shipment of the goods of the seeds around the world, and uh, which is now blocked. And it is the blockade which affecting not only the Ukrainian economy. If uh, the world leaders are now willing to take decisions to protect the Ukrainian people around our territory, you should also protect your people, your nations, and the nations you're advocating for. After the pictures from the butcher or um, Hostomel in, and from other cities, uh, that we all see, uh, I can just say that, unfortunately, but Nazism is returned to Europe. Because uh, after all this statement from the Russia's uh, propagandist and Russia's political that uh, we are forbidden to have our language, we are forbidden to have our territory, our history, our culture, we are forbidden to be actually. I have no doubt that uh, the final goal of Russia Federation, of Kremlins, is just to destroy our, uh, our country, occupy our country, and then move forward. And actually, it's not, I, I, I'm not trying to, to scare in, uh, anyone, but the next will be Baltic states or Poland. And uh, also, we, uh, we, we heard these statements from the uh, Kremlins before the start of, of, uh, of this war. My first point and the second and the third we need weapon weapon around the world of course um we use a lot of um, soviet uh, era uh, weapon and um there is a shortage of artillery ammunition to this uh, weapon i understand that um some countries of uh, former warsaw pact especially have this uh, ammunition and uh, we need it for yesterday. What the global economy, what the world economy is facing as a result of the continuation of this war. Without urgent action to end the war, urgent supply of military support, urgent urgency to, 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 to create more sanctions, to isolate the Russian economy, to end the war, meaning to have Ukraine prevail in this war. People have forgotten over time the incredibly important role that Ukraine plays in the global economy. And when we talk about a 50% decline in the Ukrainian economy, what does that mean for the rest of the world? That means we are already feeling the fuel supply challenges. We have to begin to talk very urgently about the food insecurity that this will bring. And much of that food insecurity is going to be felt by the emerging markets of Northern Africa and Middle East. We need to start thinking not only about commodity prices changing, but we need to think about the fact that the supply chain, which was already damaged by COVID, is going to be damaged even further. Ukraine is the second largest titanium source in Europe. That is airplane production. That is Airbus, that is Boeing, that is all of our travel globally. We talk about iron ore, uranium ore. So people focus in on the agriculture and the gas and the gasoline, but there is much, much more 
that this means to the world. And with every day that this war continues, the cost to the rest of the world is much, much greater than the cost of helping Ukraine today. When we look at the Ukrainian economy, Russia is suffocating and strangling the economy. It has bombed most of the infrastructure and please don't be uh, led by the newspapers to believe that this is only Eastern Ukraine. They've bombed the airports in Vinnytsia. They've bombed airports throughout railway links, fuel depots, medicine depots. They have closed any access to the ports. Ukraine is a major exporter. The more destruction that occurs in Ukraine, the more it will cost the world to rebuild Ukraine. There are all kinds of estimates today that have been provided by the Kiev School of Economics. The prime minister has talked about estimates over $500 billion of damages, but no one can be clear at this point. To be frank, the damage continues daily. So any number I give you today will be wrong tomorrow. But let, I, my, I bring my experience from Puerto Rico. <clears throat> Puerto Rico is 166th the size of Ukraine. And after the hurricanes uh, four years ago, the damage was estimated to be approximately $100 billion. It is 166th the size of Ukraine. And the damage in Ukraine to residential buildings, the damage to infrastructure has been complete in many cities. Mariupol, 80 or more percent destroyed. This is not only about the next possible steps in Europe with regard to the Baltics or Poland, but let's think about what it means to the world to allow an autocrat, a tyrant, to use power over his neighbors and not be stopped. What does that mean in Asia? What does it mean in Korea? What does it mean in parts of Africa? What does it mean if we allow this to continue? What does it mean for nuclear nonproliferation? If the Budapest Memorandum and the security assurances have been meaningless, what does it mean to the next nuclear power when we don't act now? So the costs of not ending the war and allowing, enabling Ukraine to end this war, providing it the military support it needs and the sanctions to continue to isolate that Russian economy, grow for every single person on this planet with each and every day that this war continues. I think, you know, we, we took good notes of many points, you know, particularly the, let's say, the global nature of the conflict. This is not just about Ukraine and Russia, but this is about uh, 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 the survival of a model of society, of uh, uh, tolerance, pluralism, democracy. Um, and I think this is a very, very important uh, uh, message. Of course, we, you know, we, we all admire, you know, the, the bravery of the, uh, the Ukrainian leadership and Ukrainian people.